Hi, I'm Gabby Logan and this is the II Family Money Show. In each episode, I speak to a famous face about the role money has played in their family life and professional success. I'll also get some practical tips from an expert to help you get to grips with your finances. In this episode, I speak to Lord Jim O'Neill, who spent almost two decades at the investment bank Goldman Sachs, most of which he spent as its chief economist. After growing up in South Manchester and gaining a PhD in economics, Lord O'Neill made his name in the early 2000s when he identified the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India and China, as the fastest growing economies that best symbolise the shift in global financial power. He's also a lifelong Manchester United fan, a former non-executive director at the club, and he was part of a consortium that tried to buy United from the Glazers. On top of all of that, he's worked in government too, as the Northern Powerhouse Minister. In our chat today, he tells me about his early experiences with money, becoming a superstar economist by accident, the principles he follows when it comes to investing, and where he sees the next few years going in terms of the global economy. Hello, Jim. It's lovely to meet you. Uh, Lord Jim, Lord O'Neill of Gatley, what shall I call you? That's me. Lord, I, I, I will only respond to Lord O'Neill of Gatley. <laughs> okay. no, no, I'm joking. I'm, I'm, I'm in, Jim, I'm embarrassed by the whole thing. Please call me Jim. Well, Jim, it is great to meet you. A man who, I mean, I've loved, I've loved researching and reading about you ahead of this interview. I did an economics A-level and it's really tested me <laughs> learning about you. Um, but you're a star economist. That's the kind of phrase that kept jumping out. And I wondered what it's like to be known as a star economist. It's quite funny, really. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's not the most glamorous of professions, really. So, uh in in that sense, for any 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 phrase that hints at something complimentary about somebody coming out of the world of economics, I guess it's probably quite nice. Well, in the last couple of years, and especially in science, you know, scientists have become kind of celebrities and mm. superstars, haven't they? And I think specialists in other areas are really appreciated now. And so, you know, actually, it's kind of become, for want of a better word, kind of sexy, hasn't it, to be to be very clever at something that was geeky. I seem to remember a certain cabinet member saying that we've had enough of experts. But <laughs> apparently we it, hadn't. <laughs> when it really comes to it, apparently we need them. We do indeed. And we need your expertise. But I want to go oh, back okay. to mm -hmm. you as a, as a young man at a comprehensive school in Manchester in the mid 70s. What was driving you at that time to study economics? Nothing. Playing footy. <laughs> <laughs> nothing it was it was my it was my father um you know to be honest in the in the environment i grew up um all i wanted to do was play football <laughs> um and uh i had uh, our parents i have three sisters and um my parents particularly my dad was who who left school when he was 14 and never really had the benefits of education was utterly obsessed about the benefits of education and so he just sort of drove us on and on and on to make sure that, you know, we tried to take it vaguely seriously. And um, the thing that started me on economic, he was sort of a bit obsessed about me becoming an accountant. And I had no idea what one of those would be, but it sounded really boring. Uh, and so may, maybe sort of by default, it sort of economics came up. But it it wasn't until I was deep into my university days where I started to really treat it seriously and even even then it was a bit questionable i was looking around that period of history thinking well okay margaret thatcher become leader of the conservative party oh in god 75 that, no. yeah i was thinking yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the miners had a 35 percent pay rise so maybe the it was the unions and unionization that you were interested in i, I was trying to work out what politically was motivating you but apparently it was just because you couldn't get signed as a professional footballer then uh, can, that was kind of kind of true yeah i actually did i played for manchester school boys uh when i was doing my a levels i remember also, it was it was one of those magical moments, really, where I, my own incapability ended up being for my benefit. I think of the team we played. Uh, it was the only t I played at Old Trafford for Manchester Schoolboys. We got completely thrashed by Glasgow six one, and there was of the eleven of us that started, there was only three of us that hadn't been signed up by a club, and so we we felt rather inferior, of course, but. Um, it was arguably one of the best things that ever happened to me because of, of those, there was only a couple of them that went on to sustain a proper professional career. And even at that age, they'd completely committed their lives to 
nothing other than you know training all day long and all the rest of it. And it seemed to me a bit of a weird thing to do with one's life. So I managed to escape to university where where the sort of economic thing started to become more and more intriguing for me. So you mentioned your dad left school yeah. at 14. What were the yeah. home economics like, if you like? What did he teach you about money? Or what did you observe about their patterns of investment or pensions? I mean, were there any? Not Nothing. No, they were... <laughs> Had a um, slightly odd uh, upbringing, parental-wise. So my my mother came from a Cheshire farming family. My dad came from a really central Mancunian uh, publican family. But they had no no money. My dad was a uh, originally a postman, and he sort of progressed to running a post office. But we had no money, so there was no investments. Nah, pensions. Nah. He had his post office pension, but. The whole idea of thinking of, of what to do with money, it was, it was usually in their case um, where, you know, where they could borrow the next from to try and actually for my, my three sisters, two of, the, two of the three of them went to very good schools and, and so my parents actually supported them through that. Um, in fact, he tried to persuade me to go to the top school in Manchester at the time, but because they didn't play football, I begged him to not force me. But uh, the, the, they had no... They had no uh, money to invest it, but I remember even then being worried, you know, for about a minute every other week that he seemingly was getting himself into hot with all sorts of loan sharks in order to just sort of survive, really. But uh, somehow we managed to get through it. So you're at university studying economics, and somehow yeah. it kind of starts to become a fascinating subject to you. Uh, uh -huh. And and you actually ended up doing a PhD as well. I did, yeah, I did. So did you feel like you were going to have a, an academic life, a life, you know what I mean, and, and that you were going to be somebody who would be writing about the subject for the rest of your life, rather than being practically absorbed? Most of my close friends and my three sisters all thought the idea of me doing a PhD was just like utter stupidity. And the, the only person that ever thought it was a good idea uh, was my dad, actually. And years later, uh, when I I'd, I'd then progressed into the world of work, we lived in New York for the first of two times. And he used to send me, uh, I remember it fondly, he used to send me the Manchester Football Pink every week. And, and it was addressed to Dr. Jim O'Neill. He was the only person that ever used that title in the planet. Um, I bet he uses Lord, or he would use Lord. Well, he would, uh, listen, I, I, I joked to somebody about it two days ago. My, my mum and dad have both uh, passed away, unfortunately, by the time that happened. But the very fact of me becoming a Lord would have killed them, and you know they would have died. They would have died from that. But um, the thing, what 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 happened was, um, I, I I sort of, I mean, I was a very mischievous student in the seventies, along as, as I think. What I vaguely remember, seemingly most students were in those days. We didn't we didn't have anything like the 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 the, the tough uh, demands that it seemingly a modern student has. I feel often feel for them a bit. It was, and I, I, in all seriousness, I think in terms of human development, the life of a student in those days uh, was, I mean, the making of me. I loved it. Um, and um, what what I sort of I, I kind of couldn't decide about anything I wanted to really do for a job it all seemed a bit you know why would anybody want to do something regular every day and I sort of I found myself you, you took you know it was during the era of the miners and and Maggie Thatcher and in fact I was in Sheffield which was you know right in the middle of the last days of the pitch battles of Arthur Scargill and I, I did start to get more and more intrigued in it and I, I just sort of found it intriguing that you could you could basically talk about anything under the general umbrella of economics and sort of some kind of logical reasoning would be somewhere in the middle of it. And um, to my surprise, one of my supervisors decided that I might be a good candidate for getting some money for a PhD thesis. And I thought, well, this sounds like another three years without getting a job. Why, why not? <laughs> um, and so I did. And so after that, you go into banking, and, mm -hmm. and you've described a childhood which I imagine didn't involve you coming into contact with many bankers, not or in the hedge slightest. funders, or traders, oh, or you know. God. So, so how would you describe to a young person listening to this who also has never really come across those professions? How would you describe what you did in your early banking jobs? The the era was uh, was was quite different, and in, in fact, the era where I was trying to do this was 
the flip side of what I said about university life was almost definitely very beneficial for more young people um, thinking about these things today because the whole class system seems to be a lot more rigid and defined in the late 70s still. And I remember when I started applying for jobs, not a single English institution would look at me. Uh, and I never really, I only realized years later, uh, it was almost definitely because my CV didn't have a posh school or, or Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and the thing that was a godsend for me was, was the whole appearance of American organizations into the city of London. And, and generally speaking, and I think they've played a huge, hugely important role in changing uh, the culture of that part of, of business life, at least, in sort of sowing this, the, the sort of culture of, of let's call it, uh, excellence and merit meritocracy. And certainly, you know, my life at Goldman epitomized that, where nobody really cared about where I was from. So long as I was going to be commercially useful, um, that's what mattered. And, and I, I sort of seem to thrive in that. Um, so the American I, banks I, dominate your early CV. I, I, I actually never, never worked for an English uh, entity ever uh, by, you know, I, I'm not quite sure whether that ended up being subconsciously a deliberate choice, but I, I, I've never worked for an English organisation other, other than from 17 mon months actually as a minister for the government. But, uh, but staying, staying with Goldman Sachs then in those yeah, years, yeah. Um, describe to us what you did. I mean, did you work 20 hour days? Was it crazy? Were you travelling all over the world? It was, was very, it high octane? It was very high. It was very intense. And before I joined there, I, I have to say, like it, it's generally, a, it seems to me, still the perception today that Seemed like it seemed to me like a very odd organization. And why would all these people work 20 hours a day um, and not really have a life? And, and the idea of me working there always seemed a very distant uh, notion. But um, before that, I was working, uh, it was probably the third place I worked at, uh, Swiss Bank Corporation. And I was supposedly the foreign exchange kind of guru those days. And I would compete with a, there was a person at Goldman. Uh, a guy called David Morrison who had a sort of legendary reputation and I was sort of trying to get onto his mantra and uh, when he, he left to go and work for a, fa uh, a big big hedge fund and in their, their sort of desire to find somebody like him they, they, they sort of went through the roller decks and then ended up with me and but in, importantly they were so desperate they actually offered me a partnership to join them in the days um, when it was still a private partnership and and I probably wouldn't have gone if it wouldn't have been for that because it's, it it made me think that in terms of, I I was sort of scared about the whole idea of going going into this place where everybody seemingly had an IQ of about five million and worked <laughs> twenty hours a day and uh, I thought but if they're prepared to offer me one of their precious partnerships then they're taking a, a lot of the risk in doing so and um, I was quite scared about it and I didn't think I would last long but but. As it happens, the guy that sort of drove the, the the decision to bring me on board, Lloyd Blankfein, went on a few years later to become the CEO. And he, he came from Brooklyn, and his own father had been a postman. And, and so we kind of hit it off instantly because of that. And I, I realized relatively quickly, I mean, it's a tough, mean, staggeringly ambitious place. But um, it was very meritocratic. Did you have... Did you, did you have a work-life balance at all or would you look back now and think gosh I, I really didn't kind of I, I tipped it the wrong way at times I used to I used to tease actually a lot I, a lot of people I'd, I'd, I'd often go around the trading floor even though the economics department sat in a separate floor because of compliance laws and all the rest of it but I'd walk around the trading floor and, and often uh, tease some of the young sales and trading people to make sure they were going to go home that night uh, because it would often seem to me the culture of the place would make a lot of people think, you know, you've got to just be there until the last person to turn the lights off. And I thought uh, I'd try to make an example. And so I often, if I wasn't traveling, and I traveled like crazy. So that's when it was a bigger a bigger work-life balance thing. But when I was in uh, in London, I, I would and I didn't have some dinner obligation with a client I would I would make sure I would leave by six o'clock almost almost irrelevance of the circumstances so I could get home 
the way you've worked and we've all worked in the last year um, and people are, you know, in those kind of high octane jobs have been doing it all from their desks and, and on Zoom and not travelling as much. Do you think this is going to be a permanent change to the way the culture of, of banking and funds kind of operate? I hope so. Um, uh, again, just in the past few days, I was talking to somebody and reflecting on on this this kind of technology and Again, that my Swiss bank days. We, we uh, in the in the late eighties, we we acquired a, a very specialist derivatives firm from Chicago called O'Connor and Associates. But amongst the things they were, they were basically cutting edge technology people, including with the financial instruments. But they had their own video technology. It's the first time I'd come across this thing, and the idea, you know, was supposed to be that that would cut out the need for us to ever go traveling but of course it never did but do you think do you think as well jim there was a kind of who's going to be the first one to step off do you know what i mean and the pandemic forced everybody off the roundabout at the same time didn't it i think and... it's a great point you know and going back to this I, I often describe economics as a you know it's not called the miserable science for nothing it's a it's a pure social science it can't 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 accurately explain everything or, or economists certainly should be more honest or maybe don't many of them don't realize it but it can't but what it is really good at is uh, rationalising and explaining certain big moments in time. And I think it could be a, a hugely important consequence, unforeseen, or sorry, unanticipated consequence of this mess, that it's forcing everybody to deal with the technology we've, we've had for a long time in a much more societal, fruitful way. Uh, I remember, at least yeah. I hope so. No, I'm, I'm, I remember 20 years ago, somebody trying to get me to invest in a hologram thing where you'd have a hologram of somebody in the room. And, and right. you know, like you say, there must have been so many of those things that were touted mm. that people just didn't have the confidence almost to believe that we would stop doing this ridiculous amount of travel. And so at that point, you're at Goldman Sachs, you're working long days. You're, what's your personal investment kind of portfolio or, or your m mindset like at that point? I've sort of had this sort of, I call it profit with purpose kind of mentality. So I, I sort of fell into the whole idea of uh, early stage stroke startup investing, which is ridiculously risky. Uh, and, and, you know, lots of things I've invested in go bust and you lose it all. People but, will be very surprised to hear you say that, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, but again, I'm emphasising I, I came from a background of being reasonably, more than reasonably fortunate mm. in that, you know, I didn't have to worry about money by the time I was, uh, what, in my early 40s. I didn't have to even, I, I was worth way more than I would have even began to dream about. So it meant I didn't have to think about it in a, in the same way most people probably do. So there was there so, a lot of passion projects then that you were yes, investing in. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I and the thing about uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, these things is, is is in the occasional wins that happen. Not only do you end up uh, sitting on top of a really lucrative return, but it also feels really good because you've seen a business start from nothing to employing quite a lot of people and it's a and I find that really gratifying rather than just investing in some inane distance uh entity that you, you know you know all you care about is what you see on a piece of paper when it comes through the letterbox but I did I did I did plenty of that too by the way <laughs> yeah. well also your day job was was informing all of those kinds of yeah. institutions that people would invest into whether it's pensions or other long-term Funds. I mean, what I, what I would add, if I just jump in again in that regard, it, it, you know, a couple of basic human principles, really. People, people shouldn't get overwhelmed, bamboozled by complexity and to believe that that makes it likely to be good. In fact, on the contrary, I, one, of, one of my principles, if, if I can't understand parts of an investment that are put to me, I'm like, no way I'm even going anywhere near it. Because it's usually a disguise for the fact they don't really have a proper concept. And, and, and the, more, the more simple and the more um, individual edge that uh, an investment idea has, the, the, more, the more in principle I would look at it.
Uh, but I'd apply it to a lot of investment funds too. And, I, and here, my own specific experience does make me a more seasoned skeptic than I would think most people. Because the truth of the matter, being good at, to being good at investing is really hard. You know, if, if it was that easy, we'd all own our own Caribbean island. And it's really, it's really hard. And so most investment managers uh, can't outperform for very long. And a lot of them can't outperform ever. And so you've got to be careful that you get sucked into a clever sales pitch. And, and, you, and it's important that people ask awkward and tricky questions, including how much skin in the game has the person that's trying to promote the fund got themselves. Uh, because as soon as you hear, oh, no, I, I, you know, I don't have anything to do with it. I just sell it. It's like that. That is a, a, a red light, in my opinion. In terms of passion projects, then there, there would be mm -hmm. none bigger than you investing in Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that, I thought that one might come up. <laughs> Which almost uh, was a thing, wasn't it? That almost uh, came off. Are you with hindsight? Did the right thing happen? I mean, I often say it was probably the the biggest professional failure I've ever had in my life to date. But it was the approach I was trying to sit in the middle of was was ridiculously complex. But it it was essentially a philanthropic approach to trying to own Manchester United, which is fast forward to what's happened recently is obviously pretty topical. Um, I, listen, it was ludicrously complex, and the, and the truth of the matter is, uh, once the current dreadful owners got hold of it, it was it was pretty it, it proved to be, and it still is very difficult for for virtually anybody in the world to get it off them, because it's such a unique brand, and as you know from your vast experience of sport, the whole value of live sports in a globalized world with with advertising and media rights you know Manchester United is just right up there with the New York Yankees and Dallas Cowboys and etc cetera, etc cetera. so I it would have been it would have been heaven to have pulled it off but it is also true I remember Fergie once said to me that he can't he couldn't understand why anybody would want to own a football club and uh, you know that often sits in the back of my mind you obviously mentioned, you alluded to earlier, working for the government, you kind of came out of your, your banking role and, uh, and went to be the commercial secretary to the Treasury. And one of the things you were charged with achieving and getting off the ground was the Northern Powerhouse. And, um, and that obviously, you know, you're, you're a Manchester man, born and bred. You've got that at your heart, the club at your heart. That must have been a, a joy, really, to be able to to be involved in something that's so close to your heart. I kind of passion project again, but with such huge commercial tentacles. When I was leaving Goldman, I had, I had no idea. I deliberately had no idea what I was going to do. And, but I, I also, because of the nature of the firm, I was eager to leave before I was asked to leave. It was such a competitive position uh, and place that, that I'd seen a lot of other senior people, uh, let's just say, being encouraged to leave. And I, I suspected that my ego would not be able to cope with that very well. So I decided I was going to leave way before that moment. Or maybe not way but before. You were going to wrong foot them a little bit. A little, and, a um... tiny bit. And I decided, so I, 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 but I had no idea what I was going to do. And I sort of dreamt up this mantra, if it can't be different, sorry, it can't be better, it's got to be different without having a clue what it meant. But it, 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 it was my way of trying to keep me out of just going into some other form of mainstream finance. And I was asked to uh, lead an independent review into urban growth in the UK, something that I'd never had any experience in. I thought, well, that's different. And the whole Northern Powerhouse idea came out of that. Um, I, I inelegantly used to try and describe it as Man Chef Leeds Pool because on the basis that the centre of Manchester to the centre of any of those other three cities is less than the distance of the central line. Uh, it's kind of simple as that, really. And so if, if you could get the 11 million people that lived in that big area to behave as one sort of economic unit of consumers and producers, then, hey, presto, you've got another London. So it was Man Manchef Leeds, what was it again? Man Tell me again. Manchef Leeds Pool. 
Manchester. Mine, because you, you're, oh, and the reason I ask you is because I was going to ask you about Brick, and you're a man, obviously, who's you invented the acronym Brick. So I you did. obviously like it. You obviously like a catchy my, title. It's on my forehead <laughs> for the rest of my life. Have you got a tattoo? A Brick tattoo somewhere? I, I might. I might as well do. I might as well do. I mean, uh, uh, for anybody uh, listening, the, uh, obviously uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then later South Africa. Those are the countries that you saw in the early 2000s having this very exciting growth prospect. So. Did you at the time put your money where your mouth was? Um, well, again, with the, with the proviso, there was limitations on quite what you could do. Um, I did to some degree, yeah. Um, I made a couple of investments into, um, uh, into Chinese publicly quoted bodies. Um, and the whole, the whole thing was incredible how it took off. And, it, and, and, it, and this also literally for that phase of my life, changed my life. And, uh, you know, I, I was seen as a, sort of a, a relevant person in the sort of very narrow world of foreign exchange speculation. But that whole thing lifted me into the whole world of international... Well, that's, where the, that's where the superstar status yeah, kind came of from started that. to... Yeah. I remember and, uh, about two years after it started, I was asked to give a, a keynote speech in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, in front of an audience of about, it was it was a Latin American pension fund conference, about a thousand people there, and I was asked to sort of do a presentation about the whole BRICS dream, as we called it, and just as I was going up to the to the uh, lectern, the the host whispered in my ear, "We all know in the audience here, the only reason why there's a B in BRIC is because without it, there'd be no acronym." Literally, as I was going to, and I was like, "Oh my God!" and and. And and what that told me, you know, you've got to be really careful of the crowd in, in investing. You know, investing is all about, the, you know, at one extreme it's greed and at the other extreme it's fear. And you're usually somewhere between the two. And what that told me is that all these informed people in Brazil just thought the whole idea was mad. And so when I thought it through and, and looked at what Brazil was doing policy-wise, which is why I included the B, I thought, I'm going to buy uh, some Brazilian real. Uh, and so I did. And, uh, and, and my timing was very fortunate. And, uh, and I managed to make a few bob on the back of it. So, so you did put your money where I your did. mouth is. I did. And then in 2015, you suggested that by 2020, it would be just IC or even just C. <laughs> uh, uh, is, that, is that something that you going to look back now and say, yeah, that was, I was right? Or have we seen peak China, basically? I mean, I, I sort of say those things because as I frequently try to remind people, but it, it usually gets lost still, is that, you know, the, 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 the paper that really sowed the seeds of making it famous, we, we try to show the art of the possible rather than what was necessarily going to happen. But everybody forgets that that's what we said. And in particular, we try to show that if every country achieved its full potential, this is what would happen. But of course, the idea that any country achieves its full potential is a bit mad. And the idea that all countries do at the same time is, is obviously ridiculous. But that's what the paper showed. And for some reason, it seemed to startle people that these four countries could collectively become bigger than the industrialized world. And that's what it was. Um, and the truth of the matter is the, the first decade was spectacular for all four of them. All four grew by more than any of the scenarios we laid out. And in the second decade, it's been a disaster for Brazil and uh, uh, Russia. Uh, but it's been not too bad for the other two, particularly for China. In fact, uh, China today, uh, amazingly, because this is the 20th year of the whole thing, uh, has done almost exactly what we assumed 20 years ago. Um, so China is going to slow and it's got quite a lot of challenges, m many of which get into the media often these days. But, but seen from the long term perspective of how I've looked at it, I think China's still coping pretty well with its internal and its external challenges, which are obviously quite considerable. So take your crystal ball out again for us and tell us the end of the 2020s. What does it look like? What does the global economy look like then? Are we going to have this roaring 2020s, as some predict? I'm going to be a very naughty economist briefly and, and, and give you on the one hand and on the other, which is a typical thing of the economics profession. If I look at the what I call the cyclical indicators, things that are in my veins from spending the best part of 30 years doing this, 
I've never seen anything quite like it. And and some of them are, you know, we, we tested a lot at Goldman and, and, and they can be really reliable over a six month period. And I, when I say I've never seen anything like it, the, the six I like to follow best are all showing at the same time the most remarkable optimism that I can recall. And so that suggests to me in the, for, for the balance of, of 2021, we're in for a big economic recovery around the world. And, and I have quite a lot of confidence about that. Where, where, where it doesn't help is beyond that period. And there are so many things that, that, that could go wrong, many of which relate to topical issues, whether it's the, the spat between America and China, whether it's the whole fight against climate change, whether it's we can be prepared better for future pandemics or something else I'm heavily involved in, antibiotic resistance, which is a much bigger threat than what we've just gone through, worryingly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the whole seeming inequality of growth the past decade in many Western societies and the pressure on policymakers to redistribute. All of those things make me think we're in for, let's just say, a very interesting decade. And, and, and I think there will be certainly periods of extremely strong growth. But that in itself, as we're seeing a few signs of already now, uh, could upset people worrying about the, the, the return of something people younger than me haven't really experienced, which is the inflation we had in the 70s and 80s. And if, that, if that's the case, then markets are going to be extremely volatile. And I, I wouldn't dismiss uh, that that's going to be the case, especially because we've traveled so far in the past few years. And do you, do you think that's a, a possibility inflation could gallop? I'm, I'm, somebody asked me to participate in a survey uh, in recent days and I, I, I said, I don't know. And they came back to me and said, you can't say you don't know. We want an answer yes or no. I said, well, I can. And I am saying I don't know because the evidence isn't strong enough for me to have a strong opinion. And another thing that's important about both forecasting, but particularly investing, is don't get dragged into having to do something unless you have to. And I think uh, you can see why inflation might rise a lot because there's been staggering amounts of monetary and fiscal policy support. We've all ended up doing something in the UK and other places that none of us would have thought we could do collectively, which is save a lot of money because we can't spend it on anything. And we're now all going to spend like lunatics. And so the, 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 and, and there's anecdotal evidence of price increases coming through in various things that you see in housing already, notwithstanding the pandemic. And so it, it could happen. Uh, and I'm watching uh, credible measures of, of inflation, something called, you describe it as inflation expectations. Um, there's a couple of universities around the world that, that undertake particularly reliable ones. And if that starts to get embedded and you get into this circular thing where people expect inflation and it influences wages and so on, then you know you've got it. But it's at the moment, it kind of still depends on what's going to happen a bit with policy. So my best guess is that we might get away with it for a while, but we aren't going to be able to keep growing at the kind of rates we're likely to do in the next two to three quarters without without inflation. it. Yeah, some inflation. Yeah. If yeah. DIY investors are listening to this and they're looking for investments away from the obvious, mm. they don't want to go to the, the, the FTSE 100 or the big US markets. Where should they be looking? <clears throat> uh I, I would say three things. First of all, be careful. Don't get sucked into something just because it's gone up and everybody's talking about it. In fact, on the contrary, you might get in at the wrong point. So my first message is don't do that. Think about what it is and why you really want to invest in something. The second thing is, even though valuation will never give you a reward the next day or the next month, if it's something you want to stick with, I would make sure you look carefully at whether something's uh, fairly valued or cheap or expensive. And in that regard, actually linked to the brick world, in, in the world of equities right now, so-called emerging market equities look reasonably cheap, certainly on a relative basis. Uh, and so uh, if it were being taken today as an investment decision, that would seem more sensible than it's seemed for a while, certainly compared to the US. 
And then uh, thirdly, and, and, and I'm assuming, I don't know why, I'm assuming the, the audience for us is, is, is sort of a younger generation. I think this whole sort of profit with purpose thing is in its really nascent early stage. And I, I see with my own two kids that their values and, and, and interests in life are a lot, a lot broader than the ones that came through my generation. And trying to back uh, new societal things that can make a profit as well, whether it's via some kind of fund or directly into some kind of crowdfunded investment, I, I encourage people to do that because it will end up, you know, some of them will fail, but it will end up helping make the world a better place. You don't feel as guilty with your profit. <laughs> no, exactly. <Is> that... <laughs> no, no, listen, uh, and this is what I, I think it's on the contrary. You know, I, 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 I've never had an intention of, 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 of measuring my life by, by, by how much I'm worth. But if I happen to make money from doing something that I think is useful, you know, then I'm very happy with that. It's been really fascinating chatting to you, Jim, and uh, understanding or listening to you and your understanding of perhaps how the next decade looks and what's going on. Overall, would you say you're fairly optimistic? Um, I, maybe because I've been so, through so many sort of economic and financial crises and emerged the other side. However bad it ever feels, I know that you can come out of it. So, yeah, I am. Life, life is full of opportunities and I'm a big believer in the concept of never letting a crisis go to waste. So, yeah, I am. Brilliant way to end. Thank you very much, Lord Jim O'Neill <laughs> of Gatley. <laughs> All right, thank you for having me. It was, it was great fun. Richard Hunter, Head of Markets for II, was listening in to my chat with Lord Jim O'Neill of Gatley there. Uh, Richard, so many interesting things he talked about. Uh, did you agree and uh, did you find yourself kind of nodding with some of the things he was saying about the next 10, 15 years? Yeah, absolutely. I think as an investor, you need to be um, something of an optimist. And, and generally speaking, the first question is, are things going to be better or, or do I perceive they're going to be better? Uh, in the next five or 10 years, whether that be through um, more concern for, for the environment, but still being uh, in investment terms, whether that be uh, new techn technology changes that are coming along, will the world be a more efficient and, and better run place in five years? And, and generally speaking, um, if, if you look back in history, that is the case. So yes, there will be um, bumps in the road, of course, different economies will grow at different paces but for the for the most part i absolutely agree that there are this is a big old world and there are many opportunities within it so let's talk about the diy investor and and the opportunities for somebody who isn't you know kind of aware of kind of you know hasn't got an economics degree doesn't know what you know, which markets to look for and but wants to be away from the kind of obvious places doesn't want to go to the the FTSE 100 or the big american markets where should they be going well, it's interesting um, that you should mention the FTSE 100 simply because as, as UK citizens, we tend to have this thing called home bias and invest in UK companies because we understand them or even because we've heard of them, got a pretty good, good idea of what we, we do. But interestingly, for the FTSE 100, it's estimated somewhere around 70% of earnings come from overseas. Um, so on that basis alone, you've got indirect exposure to, to you know, certain pockets uh, of the world in any case. But yes, you're absolutely right. If, if you need to look further afield, there are all sorts of specialist funds, uh, be that for emerging markets, uh, Asia, if you want to do a, a, something that's country biased, or if you want to be a bit more thematic and look out for themes, are there particular um, growth in technology that you might be uh, coming across in your day to day job, for example, which you can really see uh, taking off uh, within the next five to 10 years. But by the same token, the very fact that you're investing in funds rather than the direct shares uh, gives you the opportunity to have access to those markets or themes with someone else effectively making the difficult decisions for you. So, which is always helpful, isn't it, when you aren't an expert entrenched in, in something like emerging markets. So where are they and how easy is it for, for an investor to go and find the funds that pertain to those markets? Well, one of the problems, of course, is that there's a, a two and a half thousand shares on the UK market. There's probably two and a half thousand funds as well. And that's a be bewildering number 
uh, even to start with. So what we've done at II, we've got something called the Super 60. We basically whittled down uh, those two and a half thousand funds to, to 60, obviously, and those cover some of the things that we've been mentioning, either by country, by region, or indeed uh, by its own uh, you know that it might be an income fund it might be a growth fund and so on but even in in terms of the super 60 for example we've got four funds in there uh, which we recommend which are specifically dedicated uh, to emerging funds and you'll find our rationale uh, for looking or choosing those as well on the website so it, it, it can literally be done these days at the click of a button so you get on the website have a look at the super 60 and, and see whether or not it's for you and in terms of risk you know where would you put that in you know on a kind of one to ten basis ten being a very risky market a very risky investment do they sit somewhere in the middle um it's it's strange because um for, for rightly or wrongly someone like china is still regarding regarded as a, an emerging market even though by some predictions it could be the world's largest economy uh, in five years time but generally speaking when we think of emerging markets we tend to think of the smaller ones which of course do uh, carry um, by and large a generally higher degree of risk that being said it's also fairly well accepted that um, over your investing career certainly in, in your 20s for example you can afford to take more investment risk because you've got more time for, for that to go right whereas perhaps if you're approaching retirement uh, your risk level will come right down because obviously at that stage you're looking to protect your capital and what about the idea that we are heading into some kind of roaring 2020s whether it is a, a post pandemic uh, thing or whether or not it's just the way that you know the growth that is predicted uh, Jim was kind of slightly on the fence, I think, with that, wasn't he? You could see, obviously, some uh, big growth around the world. Where does the where does the data come from that supports an idea that that might be happening? Well, we, we've got a few things to look out for. We, we've got, um, for example, the the biggest um, release, economic release in the states every month is called the non farm payrolls, which isn't as frightening as it sounds. It's basically employment stroke unemployment, and that's already starting to show that there are certain blockages uh, in parts of the economy, particularly in the services industry, for example, where companies can't uh, just can't recruit recruit quickly enough. Uh, similarly, because some of the pent up demand that we had over the uh, pandemic is now slowly being released, there are also some uh, blockages appearing in some supply chains of raw materials, for example, which in normal circumstances means that the price of those will go up. Uh, and of course, that's inflationary. But I, I think Pretty much everyone's agreed that 2021 is going to be an extremely strong year, particularly compared to 2020. So you're going to see some eye-watering figures. The question is, of course, after we've had the madness of spending some of our savings throughout the uh, next seven months or so of this year, whether that's then going to be sustained or whether we actually think, well, we're, we're now in savings mode, we'll keep some of those back, let alone uh, goodness forbid that we should get into anything similar to this in the future so I, I think in answer to question um, 2021 it is going to be a bumper year without question uh, but the big question mark then is whether can consumer behavior has actually changed or whether this year simply represented party time post pandemic uh, you've talked about emerging markets the super 60 as well um, what are the trends that you're seeing just briefly at the moment in terms of investment what is attracting a lot of heat I think it depends on where you are on your investment career um, certainly um, for, for the people who are just trying to start to get into the market at the moment there's there's kind of startup funds which will just invest they like, 60 percent in equities you know 20 percent in bonds 20 percent in cash or a mixture of those sort of three depending on uh, your attitude to risk they're, they're certainly very popular at the moment because the, the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not um even though it's something i'm dealing with every day for, for most people it's a fairly arcane subject and it seems unattainable um but if you look at the most fun, famous fund manager in the world, Warren Buffett, his investment strategy is buy and hold forever. So on the one hand, you've got these um, pictures and, and images of people needing to trade 10 times a day to be able to make enough money. Simply not the case. If you identify the right investment in the first place, if you get it right, there shouldn't be a reason uh, for you to, to let that one go. That's interesting because actually if you set up an account on II to trade, you're, you're asked, aren't you, how many trades you anticipate doing uh, a day or a week or, you know, and the volume uh, that, you know, that you could potentially be doing um, 
would look quite daunting to some people, wouldn't it? When they think, well, I'm a, I'm a DIY investor. I, I haven't got time to do 100 trades a week. You know, I'm, I want to just kind of do five trades a week maximum or even, you know, less than that. And, and it's still possible to, to be doing that little, but also seeing your, your investment grow. Very much so, and, and, and some of our clients simply uh, choose the end of the tax year or the end of the calendar year uh, for a kind of uh, house cleaning uh, of the, their portfolios. But there's a very important distinction, I think, between the investor and trader. The investor is going to tend to go down the route of the buy and hold forever, whereas the trader may well be doing five plus trades per week because they see, in, in their mind, particular short term opportunities right right and and they fancy a dabble and, and and also have, have fun doing it often so you know why not um richard thank you so so much really interesting to hear Pleasure. what's out there and uh how people can go to ii and get involved in those emerging markets as well thanks very much indeed Gary. Thank you so much for listening. If you have time, please like and follow the II Family Money Show and leave us a review or rating in your podcast app. The II Family Money Show is brought to you by Interactive Investor. You can find loads of ideas on how to plan for you and your family's financial future at ii.co.uk. I'll see you next time. Bye.